Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for choosing to be a part of us this afternoon. Just to remind you, our webinar is titled The Evolving Cyber Threat Landscape and Risk Management. So we're going to look at how cyber is evolving um, and we will look at risk management, how to manage it within your organization, but also as an individual. You see, cyber is becoming broader than we can imagine. Uh, a few days ago, I was reading the Uganda 2020 Crime and Safety Report. And I was amazed to learn that the US Department uh, of State assessed Kampala, Kampala and uh, they categorized it as, uh, as being a critical threat location for cyber crime. I, I was rather disturbed because if you look at all the cities in, in the world, Kampala being pointed out as a, a critical threat for cyber crime was quite an opening, an eye opening uh, incidents for me. So cyber security is a big challenge, especially here in our country, Uganda. And you see, as a country, we don't even have uh, sufficient protocols to sort of deal with, uh, with, uh, with cyber crime. Uh, the panelists will tell you in terms of uh, the cyber claims that we've experienced over the years, they will even tell you how many of those have been able to be dealt with, you know, um, conclusively. So as a country, we are in a, a bad state when it comes to uh, cyber. But I know that after today, you will uh, note that there are solutions for your organization and for you as an individual. So this afternoon, we have a panel of three very well experienced, but also authorities in their right in the places in which they operate. So this afternoon, we have uh, our first panelist, uh, Mr. Brian Muine. Mr. Brian Muine is an experienced um, computer and information security person. He will tell you a bit more in detail about himself. But uh, his uh, topic that he's going to handle today is the evolution of the cyber threat. He's going to break it down for us. He's going to help us appreciate how cyber crime happens and how it's evolving. You see, the thing about cyber crime is it evolves over the years. These criminals are actually very creative. So it evolves over the years. So uh, uh, Brian is going to be uh, handling that. Welcome, Brian. And uh, our second uh, panelist will be Mr. Noah Balesanvo. And Noah is going to be talking to us about cyber security and resilience. I'm sure as an organization or as an individual, you'll be interested in knowing how to build resilience for cyber crime. So Noah, uh, you're very welcome. And we have our head of operations for Minet Limited, Ms. Uh, Winnie Chihuahua who has many years of experience in risk management. So she'll be talking to us about cyber risk management. I know for sure that Minet has got a lot of experience when it comes to risk management. And I know that specifically Winnie has handled quite a number of cases. So she'll be talking to us about cyber uh, risk management. So without any wasting any more time, I'm going to invite our uh, first panelist who will be talking to us. And I'd like to introduce you, uh, Brian. Brian, you're very welcome. Brian is the vice president of uh, Isaka Kampala chapter. He's also the vice president. He's also the vice president of the I ISC Uganda chapter and the secretary of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Uganda section. He currently works with Finca Network Support. Uh, Brian has vast experience, both education but also hands-on experience when it comes to computer engineering, both locally here and also from Leeds University. He also has a master's degree in uh, computer and information secu uh, security from the University of Liverpool. So that is the weight of the kind of panelists that we bring you. And I am sure that we're going to benefit greatly from uh, you, Brian. Brian, uh, welcome and please take us away. Thank you very much, Alan, for your kind words. So for today's, uh, for today's topic, I'll, I'll start with the, the introductory part of it, where we are going to talk about basically the evolving cyber threat landscape. Um, I will talk about basically what's been happening and uh, 
what, how we are going to transition basically into the future. I'll leave that up to Noah, who will talk about the way forward and um, the current, the trends right now in terms of information security. So as um, already introduced, um, I am the vice president of Isaka Kampala chapter, but I also hold other capacities in the ISC2 chapter and the IEEE um, chapter as well. So that's the IEEE section in Uganda. So <clears throat> where are we coming from? So it, where it all started is we had, how, how did this cybersecurity incidences come up? So we have, uh, I, point, I pointed out basically the first four where um, cyber, cyber threat attackers, the, the money bit of it, the fame, internal feuds and the creativity. So when you talk about um, the motivations of um, attackers, where they're coming from. So we are looking at these four uh, incidences or basically the motivations of why they're after um, attacking companies. So um, you, look at, you look at the very trends and when you look at actually the um, cybersecurity platform as it is of late, during this COVID-19 uh, the pandemic, you notice that there are so many incidences that have been happening. And in terms of um, where people are actually working from home, they are more, the risks are very high as we are working from home. So you find that people are not updating their, their uh, viruses, antiviruses, they're working using VPNs. And some of those VPNs can actually be uh, fake as we speak. Um, I actually read about uh, Amazon um, Web Services where they had uh, a serious um, DDoS attack and it affected most of their clients. So you have incidences like those that affect uh, potential clients. And um, it, where does that lead us to? We end up having to shift from different cloud platforms and um, that it actually puts the cybersecurity risk on um, elevated in terms of um, protecting the systems, introducing more services that are actually vulnerable to these potential attacks. So like I said before, it's been a tough ride and uh, cyber threats are now on the increase. And especially during this uh, 2020-2021 pandemic uh, with the COVID-19, people are taking advantage of the vulnerabilities that companies are facing. And I think we have been reading it more in the news now um, where cyber attackers are now using uh, ransomware to, to attack companies. Recently, there was one in the US uh, where they actually attacked a, a, a factory and they, they went down and they actually lost a potential of 5 million US dollars. And that was just in one, one day. So you can imagine the, the impact of all this and um, how much companies are actually having to pay off to, to avoid these, um, these threats. So um, um, I don't know if you read about it, but just two days ago, um, as an example of uh, recent attacks, it was revealed that uh, criminals unleashed a massive ransomware attack in more than a dozen countries. And um, it was affecting 1,500 organizations around the world, including supermarket chains in Sweden and schools in New Zealand. So this is just a brief of what is happening right now and the potential of what the attackers can do and how much it's, it's uh, affecting um, the companies and how much they're having to pay, uh, which is actually becoming illegal. Um, in the USA, they are thinking about having companies not paying for ransomware. But eventually when you balance it out, the companies are actually losing out in terms of finances. And um, it's, 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 it's a two-way two trend where you find that um, they, they actually have to pay in order to have operations moving along. Another 
recent attack was about five days ago, uh, where about 200 US businesses were hit by colossal ransomware attack. Uh, this was according to a cybersecurity firm in the US. And uh, they believe that um, this uh, the targeted uh, Florida-based IT company, Kaseya, was, um, was affected by it. Now, this Kaseya is basically a tool that has been used by most companies in terms of protecting uh, individual laptops, individual computers, uh, especially for those who are actually working from home. So you can, you can actually see that this was, it was proven that it was actually Russian linked. Uh, it was Russian linked to the evil, rival uh, ransomware gang uh, that is based in the US. Um, and when you look at the current attacks, leave, uh, the most affecting one is the ransomware. And why I insist about it is you look at attackers who are basing, that they're, they're looking at their motivation is money. And the platform that they can actually use is ransomware, where they know that they can have companies um, having to pay for, 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 for the damage that they have done. So you find that a classic example of uh, cyber security, cyber criminals following the money, the high value of cryptocurrencies. And, and when you look at it um, in the modern day and age, everyone is turning towards cr uh, cryptocurrencies, but unfortunately they are also vulnerable in a way that cyber attackers are getting cleverer and cleverer and they're using artificial intelligence, machine learning to actually um, get hold of these cryptocurrencies, and um, you end up you end up having people who are losing money in it. Um, so when we look at uh, who are at risk, so these are a couple of companies that we are looking at. We are looking at banking, financial institutions, telecommunication companies, oil and gas companies, healthcare, um, government agencies, and uh, higher education facilities. Um, and in terms of uh, these current attacks, most of what um, attackers are using are basically social engineering. As much as it seems um, something very simple, um, many users are actually falling prey to social engineering. And uh, it, as, as we all know, the human factor is always the weakest link whenever it comes to information security. So you have social engineering becoming a successful attack vector. Phishing emails, they are a popular mechanism of and often carefully targeting senior executives or finance departments because they know that those are the most vulnerable. Um, but it's not only email which um, the attackers are using as well. And most employees can be tricked using phone calls. So you receive a phone call, and you eventually fall prey to this social engineering using phones. So when they receive these phone calls, sometimes you end up revealing um, information that is, um, is, 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 is very critical for companies. And uh, once they use that, you eventually fall prey to social engineering. Um, another current attack right now that like we're talking about that is actually picking up a lot of weight is crypto jacking. And with the, like I mentioned previously, with the rise of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, there is, um, there is a rise in cryptocurrency mining. And we're talking about um, hijacking, uh, which is uh, basically crypto jacking. It's a kind of hijacking where someone uses your computer to mine for cryptocurrency without your consent. So hackers normally do this by sending malicious links or infecting an online website or an advert with code that begins with mining the process. So it's, it's actually picking up, it's becoming a trend, unfortunately. And uh, the vast amount of money that um, car, uh, companies are losing is one is actually through this crypto jacking as I've mentioned before. So um, without much ado, I will pass on the second bit of uh, my presentation to Mr. Noah, um, who will talk about the rest of the topic, which is uh, evolving the landscape of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, sorry, with uh, crypto attacks. Thank you, Mr. Noah. Thank you, Mr. Noah. Thank you, Mr. Noah. Thank you, Mr. Noah. Thank you, Mr. Noah.
So over to you, Mr. Noah. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Brian. Thank you. That was a very enlightening presentation. I hope all our attendees found it enlightening. Thank you, Brian, for bringing to light the different ways in which cyber you know, attackers come to us. You know, sometimes innocent emails and innocent phone calls can, can turn out to be extremely dangerous. So thank you very much. I just wanted to communicate that you can use our Q&A section or the chat to ask any questions and those will be passed on to the panelists. We'll have a Q&A time where, where panelists answer all your questions. So please use those spaces. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Now, our next panelist is uh, Elder Noah Balesambu. So Noah is an ex has extensive experience in the technology space. And Noah has uh, dealt with both the banking sector, with the technology, with the telecom sector, through different corporations, talk of MTN, talk of ZTE, talk of the different banks. He's quite served in different spaces in that area. He has served as the founder, managing partner, and lead consultant at Com Computer Forensics Consult Limited. And uh, he also currently serves as the National Information Security Advisory Group Chairman. He also serves on the SAT for the no Northern Corridor Infrastructure Projects. Noah is a thought leader, really. If you ask me about Noah in the space of cyberspace, personally, I call him uh, an expert or I call him a thought leader when it comes to that space. Because you could ask him about anything. He's consulted with banks. He's consulted with the uh, telecoms. He's also consulted with the different uh, uh, organizations that you can talk of. Currently, uh, Noah is the founder and also head of strategy at Crypto Savannah, uh, which is a blockchain and emerging technologies firm. I hope that he will spare one of his last minutes to just you know, demystify blockchain but I will leave that up to uh, Noah. Noah, you're very, uh, very welcome. And uh, please, please take us away. Um, thank you, Alan, and thank you the team at UNET for, uh, for the opportunity to come and, and share on, uh, on cybersecurity. This is a, a, a topic that is uh, passionate, as Alan has mentioned. Um, I've been in cybersecurity for the past, almost 16 years and um and and as and as brian has said it is continuously evolving uh the risks that we used to to, to face back in 2003 2004 are completely different from the ones that we face today and uh, and as long as there's value there will always be criminals looking for value it's it's, it's unfortunately a, a, a human trait whether the, the it's just that the tools have changed um so just to pick up from where Brian had uh, left off. Um, so Brian talked mainly about uh, the threats, which I'll just touch on, but before that, I just wanted to, to go to the basics because sometimes we understand cybersecurity and cyber resilience differently. And so even, even when um, uh, I was approached to, 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 to speak about uh, risks in, uh, to do with cybersecurity and cyber resilience, just even going down to the definition, uh, there, there is, there's, there's a different understanding uh, of the two terms, cybersecurity and cyber resilience. So I just wanted to, 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 to set us off and, and define what that is. And so uh, cybersecurity is basically under the most layman terms of understanding, it's basically defending uh, cyber attacks. That's what cybersecurity is. And so it's all the investment you make to protect your systems against an unauthorized and, and exploitation uh, by attackers. Um, this is usually done by, uh, you know, uh, the three main groups that are involved, as Brian has mentioned, in in, um, in, in cyber threats uh, or what we call cyber attacks. Are you know, there's what there's the cyber crime. This is where people actors are looking for targeted systems to for financial gain. And then there is there is actually a cyber attack, which uh, which uh, most of the time uh, involves politically motivated uh, players or more politically politically motivated actors. Uh, you know, to, to try and get either access to information or classified information or even cyber espionage falls under this. Then there's cyber terrorism where, uh, you know, the intended effect is to undermine electronic systems to cause panic and fear. Um, uh, Brian, again, has talked a lot about these, the different methods in which uh, cyber threats are, 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 are used. Uh, malware, which is simply malicious software, 
and this is the most popular way of, of, of cyber attack or cyber threat because it takes advantage of weaknesses in both human behavior and systems. Uh, SQL injection is, used, is mainly used by more skilled uh, attackers because uh, the, this one is where they attack uh, really sensitive, uh, well-protected systems. And so the, the level of investment by the attacker is much higher. Uh, there's also uh, phishing, which is basically um, a, a term used to, uh, you know, to, 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 to describe how attackers uh, and, uh, make, vi uh, people for, make vic victims fall uh, into things like emails, uh, email, email attacks, where different people are, um, are then uh, duped to following specific links uh you know and then then that one uh, creates a vulnerability in the, in the computer then there's also what they call a man in the middle attack here the example is if you go into a, an, an open wi-fi without any sort of uh security uh you know installation in your devices someone can come in between you and the wi-fi and the internet using through an unsecure wi-fi and start sifting through your your your, your traffic and and in, in that process they can uh, access sensitive information and there's also what we call a denial of service attack. This is whereby uh, the attackers just want to make sure uh, that, that your, your, your services do not run. And so they either flood uh, your online services with a lot of um, traffic so that you know, it, it grinds your network to a halt. So what are the principles of good cybersecurity? Just to move the conversation forward. So after understanding what the risks are, what the threats are, why, how do we protect ourselves? What are what are good things to live by uh, within your organizations? And I, my, my belief is that good principles of cybersecurity are hinged on these three main aspects. Uh, uh, and so it's around people, processes, and technology. Uh, in my experience, uh, organizations are very quick. If they are savvy, they are very quick to go for technology because that's a simple plug and play. I buy this software, I buy that software, and then there's a whole set of security. And then when there's a breach, there's usually all those accountabilities like, but we paid for this, but we paid for that. And so one of the statements that I'd I always leave uh, when making this speech is that um, cybersecurity is not a tool. It is not, it is not a piece of software. Cybersecurity is a practice. It's a culture. And we'll speak about that a bit later. And so what are the three pillars of good cybersecurity in terms of trying to implement it within an organization? An organization? The pillar, the, which I feel is the most important pillar of cybersecurity is the people. Uh, and so the best thing an organization can do is hire the right people and get them trained. So this uh, aspect, this pillar, uh, you know, revolves around the recruitment, the training, the deployment, and the retention of people within the cybersecurity function of an organization. And, that's a, uh, and, and once they are well-trained and, well, uh, and, and well-exposed to all this new research and development, they're the first line of defense for any cyber attack. Um, the next, an organization needs the right processes and policies in place to make sure that, uh, to facilitate the protection of information, of their information structure, uh, infrastructure and critical business systems. So you must have the policies. So it's, it's one thing to have the people, but you have to have the policies and the procedures that these people enforce, that you enforce within your organization to, 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 force, to foster a culture of good cybersecurity practices. That's, then after that is when the technology comes in. The technology comes in to augment the processes and the people that you have within your organization. And so in terms of order, that is how it is. You start with the right people, give them the right processes and policies, and then implement the right technology. And then you have a good cybersecurity regime. So again, in, in contrast to what cybersecurity is, there is cyber resilience. I and mean, when it comes to definitions, uh, cyber resilience is defined as the measure of an enterprise's ability to continue working as normal while it attempts to prevent and detect, control, and recover from threats against uh, its infrastructure. And so uh, while cybersecurity is the defense or the defense from cyber attack, cyber resilience looks more inwardly towards the organization to, to, to see and to ask the question, how quickly can we recover from an attack? Or even when we are being attacked, how can we make sure that the organization still runs and serves its business goals? while the attack is being uh, controlled and recovery mechanisms are being put in place. So these work in hand, hand in hand. So you have good practices for cyber security while implementing good practices for cyber resilience. And then a good strong cyber security framework is what is needed within companies 
to be able to identify bad actors to, to who could gain access to your network. So it's also all good to understand the risks and, and Brian has done a good job of doing that, understand what, the, what are the potential risks my organization could face externally and what can I do internally to make sure that I'm resilient to these attacks. And so good principles of good cyber resilience are hinged about international, there are many standards that one can use, but they all revolve around these main five uh, uh, principles. Number one, to be able to identify your critical assets. Uh, I've spoken to many organizations who do not know what their vulnerable information is. Uh, protecting the IT, the, the servers is not, is, is not protecting the information. Put a, putting the server room under lock and key is not necessarily so good, uh, uh, keeping your information secure. So it's, a, it's good to understand what your critical information is and then classify it as such. After you have identified your critical information, you then protect it. Uh, you protect where it is hosted, you protect the information itself, how it is transmitted and where it is stored. And so you protect the, bush, the, the, the creation, transmission and storage of the, of the information. And then of course, once you've identified that your critical information and you're protecting it, put a mechanism in place to detect any suspicious behavior. So this means you benchmark your normal behavior and then set up your equipment and processes such that any, uh, any uh, suspicious events uh, stick out as a sore so thumb in order to make sure that you're detecting it. Then after you've detected it, you should have mechanisms to respond. And so what are the failover, uh, you know, the, 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 what, are, what are your breach mechanism, uh, you know, uh, processes? If you detect that you've been attacked, what are the, what, what's your incidence response plan? So all these things are then uh, you know, articulated and put in place within the, your response uh, uh, principle. Then after that, of course, you need to also think about recovery. What is your disaster recovery plan? What is your business continuity plan? All that comes under recovery, where you restore the infected infrastructure by restoring means that there was also in place a backup and uh, and regime where your most recent information can be found. And so once you implement these five principles, you are then uh, on your way towards having good cyber resilience. And so when you compare the two, uh, cyber security and cyber resilience, one way of thinking about it in a simplistic way is that uh, the cyber resilience involves accepting the fact that no cyber security solution is perfect or capable of protecting you against every possible form of cyber threat. What is, uh, and this is why every company needs both aspects of cyber security and cyber resilience. The cyber security strategy is designed to minimize the risks of attacks uh, get coming through, while cyber resilience makes sure that you have the right strategy in place to keep you moving, even though you're under attack. And so what should you do as organizations? I want to close with this. So for practical cyber security steps, uh, Brian has mentioned a few. Um, what you can, the, the things like, you know, running your devices, making sure they're up to date, the firmware is, uh, is, is, is updated. Uh, Brian talks about VPNs. Don't, the, my, my policy is don't use free VPN. If, you, if your VPN is free, you're paying for it in one way or another, either with your personal data or with a lack of security. VPNs, if you to use them, use paid ones, because those ones tend to have better, uh, better security practices. Of course, your software must be updated. Don't use pirated software. If you've downloaded your software and you don't have, uh, uh, you've not purchased it legally, then it is vulnerable to attack. And that can not only expose you and your personal information, but your organization's information. And then also ensuring that employees at all levels, not just the, 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 the IT people, but at all levels are educated in the, in, in the potential threats uh, of cybersecurity. What are, the other, what are the other things you should do for good cyber resilience? I'll uh, just end with about five points. One, employ uh, a CIO or CS, CISO who is, uh, a, who is experienced in, um, in, in cybersecurity. The organization that Brian uh, represents for Uganda, the ISC2, uh, did a study and found that 86% of organizations perform well in security if they have a chief information security officer at the helm. That's important because many implementing many uh, of these standards, for example, ISO standards require there's a there's a there's a there's a separate uh, organizational or, or 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 a separate governance structure for cybersecurity that is separate from IT. There are many organizations bunch IT and cybersecurity in one, which to me is akin of putting accounting and auditing in the same department. The reason we have accounting and auditors separate functions within an organization is because they serve different purposes, even though they look at the same numbers. Same thing, even though we're working in the same infrastructure, IT is geared towards operations where security is geared towards having that eye of cyber resilience and security. 
Second is to nurture a, a, a culture of cyber resilience. Like I said, cybersecurity and cyber resilience is not a tool. It is not some fancy software you install. It is a culture that your people are number one, that your people have, have embraced. So companies make the mistake of leaving cyber security solely for the hands of the security team or the IT team. And so you must ensure that you have mechanisms in your organization that make everyone familiar with, this, with the risks of, of, of IT. And then, and then it, it is developed as a culture across the entire organization because cybersecurity, you're only as secure as your weakest link. So you have to make sure that you have no weak links. Then of course, creating formal cybersecurity policies uh, that, are, that, are, that are observed, that the challenge is that many people put in very nice policies and they, and they gather dust in the shelves. But here you, you, you operationalize cybersecurity policies through your, through your, you know, and this must be enforced right from the top. I've met in organizations, they have very good policies, but then the people that are most at risk are the ones that don't follow the policy. You say no, you know, you, let's say I bring your own device uh, policy who says no personal devices on the, on the computer network or don't put company information on personal devices. Yet you find it's the CEOs or the CXOs that have, that are exempt from these policies. And guess what? That's where the cyber risk happens. They're then exposed and yet they're the ones who have access to the most sensitive information. So this must be policies that, 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 that span across the organization in order to be able to protect it. Then of course, make cyber resilience a priority at boards. I've spoken to many boards over the years and, and when you mention the word cyber security, they all automatically look to the IT person and says, for us, we don't understand these technical things. Now that's where the first risk comes from because if you do not understand these IT, IT things, then you will not approve necessary expenditure to protect your, your, your organization. So cyber security must be a concern at the top level. When you're looking at thing, implementing things like uh, ISO 27000, there must be a direct line to the board uh, you know, if you're to fully comply with that standard, there must be a direct line to the board when it comes to matters of cybersecurity. And so these are things that even the small SMEs within Uganda must take seriously because cybersecurity is both practices and resources. And those resources must be fully appreciated by the board if they're to make, if they're to endorse any policies or expenditures along cybersecurity. Then also finally, offer a career path for cybersecurity professionals. I've spoken to organizations who Yes, we have created the cybersecurity department. Yes, we have done this, we have done this, but there is no motivation for people to stay within those parts. The, 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 the professionals within these organizations don't see a future. They are, they, they are stuck in their roles. So I think that I'm challenging organizations, but even governments to create career paths for security professionals where they, see, uh, they, they, where they see professional development within the organization. That then stops that very high turnover of cybersecurity professionals which is also a risk because you do, you spend all your time training these people, but because they don't see any career development, they move ship. And so also now, and now that what one of the things that COVID has exposed is that our Ugandan talents are now employable for, in, in foreign places. So you find your competition is not only in Uganda here for your cybersecurity professionals. They are, you know, they're, 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 the competition is global. Microsoft can, can poach them, Facebook can poach them. I know a number of, of, of Ugandans that live here in Uganda, but work for these big organizations. So now the, 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 the space, and right now one of cybersecurity is one of the most in-demand uh, uh, talents and skills globally. And so you need to create a, 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 a career path for your professionals. Now, once you've fully embraced this, I have rushed through this, uh, but you can ask any questions that, that come up. Other than that, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, Pastor Allen, over back to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Elder Noah. I think there's no better way to put it. Resilience, resilience, resilience. And I think that's very practical. Noah, I, I just want to thank you so much because you've given us very practical ways in which we can build cyber resilience as, uh, as organizations, but also as individuals. One of the things that has stood out for me is to know that putting the server room under lock and key is not sufficient to guarantee uh, cyber security. And then to know that uh, cyber resilience has got to be a discussion at the board level. I'm not sure many organizations actually take cyber uh, resilience or cyber security to that level. Yeah? I know that most organizations will have an IT and, and, and you know, everything gets mixed in there. Thank you so much, Noah, for that uh, very elaborate uh, presentation. So our dear attendees, you will notice that uh, panelist Brian handled the evolution of cyber, how cyber has been evolving. 
Elder Noah has now handled cyber resilience. How do you build resilience as an organization or as an individual? Now, the part that we want to handle next is the one on cyber risk management. And who else is better placed to talk about cyber risk management than a person who works uh, in a risk management firm or who's a risk manager themselves? Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce our next pa panelist. Uh, Ms. Winnie Chihuahua. Ms. Winnie Chihuahua is the current Chief Operations Officer at Minet Limited. You will note that Minet Limited is a trusted Pan-African risk reinsurance and human capital advisor. I know that many people on this call have experienced services that have been given by uh, Minet. Winnie has experience in excess of 20 years. She's been in the risk management business for over 20 uh, years. And she's built experience in underwriting, in claims management, and in risk management itself. So Winnie has got broad experience. When we talk about broad experience, it means she has dealt with telecoms, she has dealt with banks, she has dealt with manufacturing companies, she's dealt with education institutions, she's dealt with different sectors within the economy or within the uh, country. I know that Winnie is also um, a, a, a senior associate of the Australian and New Zealand Institute of Insurance and Finance. And she's also a member of the technical committee of the Insurance Brokers Association of Uganda. So that's the kind of experience that panelist Winnie uh, brings on board. Winnie, uh, you're welcome and over to you. Um, thank you, Ale, uh, for such um, a great intro. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and, and colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you today in our webinar, and thank you for taking the time off to join us. I can see the numbers are good. We have over 100 participants on, on this webinar, so that's really, really exciting. Thank you, Brian and Noah, for such deep insights. I mean, it's such valuable information, and, and it's a pleasure having you as um, my co-panelist today, and I'm happy about the information that has been relayed to our participants. So just like uh, Alan has mentioned, uh, mine is to tackle the risk management uh, part of, um, of today's uh, presentation. Uh, Noah and Brian have already done an elaborate uh, uh, job on, on what, what we're going to talk about. So you're going to find that I'm, I might have just run through some of my slides because they've already given us detail on, on, on some of those threats that I'd highlighted and the impact. Uh, but I'll try and lay emphasis around uh, 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 risk management in the line of uh, insurance and what we're doing and how we can, we can support you as Minet. And some of those very practical, simple things that you would do within, within your organization. So I hope at the end of it all, you'll all have gained a lot of value from our conversations. And please keep the conversations going. So I'll start straight with my, with my presentation. And, and that's, that's the agenda. I'll, I'll run through. It looks like the, quite a number of slides, but I'll try and run through so that we manage uh, our time. Um, okay, I thought that I needed, we needed to look at a little bit of the Ugandan case. I know Brian touched on that, uh, but I just wanted to share just three, three items out of uh, the cyber risk uh, landscape in Uganda. And this I picked from the African Cyber Security Report Uganda 2019, 2020, of which, Brian and, and, and Noah actually contributed. If you go and read that report, you're going to find those two gentlemen and, and they contributed to that report. So in case of any detail around that report, again, we have uh, Brian and Noah on, on the call. So in Uganda, 2019-2020 marked an increase in attack techniques in all the key sectors. I think Brian and Noah have already shared the specific areas uh, where the attacks actually happened globally, but even in Uganda, we're not insulated, so they, they actually happen in all sectors, financial services, government, manufacturing, including insurance. So again, the same report talks about 248 reported cases of cyber crime in 2019, up from 190, 198 in 2018. So these are some of the areas of the losses that were highlighted in that report. Business email compromise, which I've already been talked about, the social engineering, fraudulent SIM card registration. I think this drives home to many of you. 
you've heard about this and SIM card swapping, online impersonation of high profile people and, and malware database manipulation report ac remote access and vulnerabilities that come with it. Again, I'm not going to labor going into these details because again, my, my co-panelists had already touched on that. But also on the good side, I know Alan started off by saying we are such a big threat as a country, but there is, there is also a good side in this report, a positive side. Uganda was ranked as the most secure cyberspace in Africa in, in 2018 in the National Cybersecurity Index. So this National Cybersecurity Index is a global index that measures preparedness of countries to prevent cyber threats and manage incidents. It's nice, I think, to see to see that you're gonna sit somewhere in, 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 in and looked at in a positive way. I thought that we needed just to quickly share on that. Okay, so cyber risk exposure. Why should organizations be concerned? Yeah, and, and what kind of business are you doing for you to be concerned? Why should you be concerned about cyber risk? And below are just a few. Uh, 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 items that we have highlighted to show why you should be concerned about the cyber risk. If you gather, maintain, disseminate, or store private information, you should be concerned. I know where all of us sit in our businesses, we do. Some in bigger ways compared to others. It's a school, it's a bank, it's a healthcare provider, it's an insurance company, you're collecting information. If you have a high degree of dependency on electronic processes, I think now we all are. We're all digital, we're all wired technology-wise, so we all have that exposure and should be concerned. If you engage vendors, now third parties have become such a weak point for many businesses. You know, as we go into the cloud solutions, as we go into to outsource software, as we go finding service providers and strategic partnerships, there's risk that comes with it. If you're subject to regulatory statutes, again, we all are. There's a regulatory framework somewhere that at least you report to that concerns you, that touches your business. If you're required to comply with the PIC security standards and plastic cards, I know the banks and financial institutions and some organizations, if you rely on critical infrastructure. Now, this is a big one at the moment. You heard about the hack on the, on the pipeline in the US. You know, it can happen anywhere. It can happen to our our national water, it can happen to, you know, our key electricity provider. It can happen in a, a big industrial operation. So if it's critical infrastructure, yes, you need to be concerned. Then the next one is about employees. I think our weakest point sometimes is the employees. So we can't ignore them. Noah mentioned that. People, processes, technology, we can't forget about employees. And sometimes we have rogue employees that are disgruntled and so create exposures for the organization. So as the digital frontier evolves and technology evolves, we all must be alert that this is a risk that is with us. Again, in, in, in line with the landscape, I'm not going to labor a lot around these, uh, these risks or what could go wrong. Ransomware has already been talked about. Data breach, extremely important because of the regulatory framework and the requirements of us to safeguard uh, the data. Website defacement may seem a little bit traditional, but it still happens where one takes over your, your, your website and posts whatever they want on it. Uh, then the, the denial of services, again, Noah mentioned something about it that paralyzes the entire operations and systems of the organization. Then multimedia liability, this is major because you know we, we disseminate content into the digital space. There, there could be copyright issues, many times unintended, but it creates liability for the organization you know, uh, uh, infringement on, uh, on, 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 on private property, on, um, on, um, on, on, on people's privacy. I mean, again, that creates a, a, a risk for all of us. And also phishing, which is in line with social engineering. So again, still with the landscape, the impact, this is part of the impact that we, we're likely to see because of those risks. Brand and reputational damage. Sometimes you can't even put a price to this. Companies spend years, you know, building brands and just one incident can actually damage the reputation of the organization. And a lot of money has to be spent in trying to get back to where you were before and trying to get back your reputation to where it was. Uh, regulatory response and claims investigation costs because there are protocols that are put in place for you to follow in case of any breach, 
again, this, this is the kind of impact you, you pay money to take to carry out the, the, the fines, the investigation, and other protocols that come with this. Business interruption, which puts companies on their knees. You lose income, you lose revenue because you cannot trade, because you cannot continue to operate. You incur increased costs of working, again, because of particular cyber incident. And then lastly, uh, but not least, is the data loss. Again, we have obligations, which are regulatory. We have obligations to do the contracts we signed with our clients and, and, and there are repercussions that will come with it, even reinstating the data and any other liabilities that will come out of it. So that's the kind of impact. Just to bring this uh, forward in terms of um, uh, a typical cyber incident and how it can happen. I just wanted to share with you, this is a case study. And so that you put it in proper perspective, when I talk about the insurance policy later, then you'll see why you need to take out insurance and how insurance would respond to this particular case study. So th this is a typical uh, cyber claim, okay? And how it plays, this is basically how it plays. In this, there's cyber extortion, there's business interruption and there's privacy breach. So if you see our very first box, the CEO receives an email demanding a ransom of $500,000 worth of Bitcoin in 24 hours, okay? So otherwise it's an, an anonymous hacker will release the sensitive customer information. So even throws a sample to show that, look, I have it. If you want proof, I have it, yeah? And then it goes to shut down the critical business system. The next box determining what exactly it is. So. The CEO, of course, informed, the, uh, the informed of the email and noticing anomalies in the network. The, CI, the CISO hires a third party forensic expert, which determines the threat is real. More than 500,000 sensitive customer records have actually been accessed. So there's privacy breach there, there's data has been lost about the company. So the law enforcement is, is engaged, but before a decision regarding the ransom can be made, the hackers now release half of the information and records they have obtained and managed to make some critical network inaccessible. So they paralyze the network, they release part of the information. So clients and colleagues are not able to access critical system and processes and all their orders. So the ransom is paid. Obviously we want business continuity. Noah talked about, I think Brian talked about a law that is in the offing in the US. I think they want to stop payment of ransom because they think it promotes, it promotes the, the the, the, the vice. So the ransom is paid to prevent any further damage. Legal counsel is hired to assist in the notice to individuals impacted by the breach and monitoring also is offered. Another vendor is hired to handle the public relations campaign. So you can see already costs have started stepping in. And the critical system remains down for 10 days. This is business interruption. So it's impacting customer orders, general business operations, significant costs are incurred for loss of income, expenses related to the outage and to get the business back into operation. This is all business interruption. Then two weeks later, uh, there's a breach notice went out. A class action suit is filed alleging failure to properly protect private information. So clearly you can see all of them at play. The extortion, the business interruption and the privacy breach all in one. So what are some of the things that we can do to try and prevent, you know, and mitigate? Noah has already touched on this one, so I'll just run through this so that we don't spend a lot of time. I think it's important that we navigate new exposures. As you move into, uh, we have this rapid digitization, remote working, we need to continuously assess the exposures, continuously, and I'll use that word continuously. So it can't be a one-off event. It has to be done, you know, severally over a period of time. Assemble data security teams. I think the people is it's even a regulatory requirement that we have a data. So, what data are you using? What do, do you understand the threats to the company? Third parties who are processing the same, the same, the same information are they aware of the obligations? So understanding the law is important in and both local and foreign, you, you know about the GDPR, and then of course our data protection act here locally. You have to develop data protection 
privacy policies. Noah talked about this, again, to manage the risk. Then train, test, update, and monitor all your policies. Cyber hygiene, we need to emphasize. Your employees must be aware. They must be able to detect. They must be able to say that this is a potential a risk or a, a hack to the organization. Then controlling hardware and software. Noah talked about this, protecting our, our hardware, protecting the software as well. The software supply chain is becoming a critical area, carrying out penetration tests and vulnerability studies and reports. And of course, you need adequate business resilient measures, which Noah has already handled very well. If you're going to respond to a ransomware attack, you, you must have the controls in place, first of all, but you must be prepared so that when it happens, you are in good, you know, you're good to go. You know, a good cyber response plan would really help. The reason why we need insurance policies have gaps and the traditional policies that have not been tailored to address uh, you know, cyber related risks. If you look at property, it addresses tangible product pro property. If you look at the traditional crime policy, it talks about theft of money, securities, tangible products. If you look at the E and O's and liability, again, they were not really structured to address cyber risks. And that's why we need uh, standalone cyber insurance uh, policies. So again, we are always blamed for being very, we're talking about our insurance jargon. We've tried as much as possible to break down this, this policy in the simplest language, you know, for everybody's understanding. So three sections, basically for here, we talk about two main sections. There is the third party liability section and then the first party section. So third party is to deal with the third party liabilities. First party is the losses that come to you directly as the insured. So we're talking about defense costs that you might have to incur following a cyber threat. This is covered under the third party liability section. Failure of network security. Again, it comes with liabilities, any claims and settlements that you have to pay following uh, uh, a network uh, security uh, breach. Any form of wrongful disclosure of private information or what we call PII, personally identifiable information, including your employees' information, by the way, that has to be safeguarded. Any privacy related security or regulator investigations, I talked about the fines and penalties. All, all these committed by an outsourcer, third parties, vendors, suppliers. Again, if they are committed and if there's a breach of the suppliers, again, the police will respond because it, it's, it's viewed as if it has happened at your premises. Okay? Uh, breach of duty of processing personal information and, of course, media, which I talked about which I talked about. Then the first party handles any business interruption following a network failure or a system failure. Property damage. We know that some cyber attacks actually render equipment completely useless. I think the insurance term we use in the cyber policies is, is bricking. I think it's called bricking. That's damage. You, you don't see physical damage, but a cyber attack has rendered this equipment useless. Data restoration costs of putting back the data, of corrupted data, and then e-theft. Again, this is a big one, and many, many people tend to have suffered around this area in terms of fraudulent funds transfer, phishing, social engineering, where they steal your identity and are able to steal your money, uh, you know, using uh, trickery uh, through your accessing your information. Employee sabotage, which we talked about, and of course, extortion, which is a big thing at the moment uh, globally. As I mentioned earlier, I think cyber insurance is not an indemnity policy, largely, I'll put it that way. It's not an indemnity policy, it is a service policy. Most of the time you want the services rendered to get you back into business. So that's why we use a panel of service providers. All insurers that have taken out insurance for cyber in the back end have a panel of service providers that will come in at that point when the hack or a cyber incident has occurred. So that you, you, you have crisis management providers, you will have legal providers, you will have call center providers, because each of these is trying to address a specific uh, issue and impact that has come up then. And then, of course, the IT and forensic, these are usually the first guys they'll call in when you've suffered a major hack. So I just quickly talk about the insurance market, and specifically for Uganda. In Uganda, we... we at the moment, we don't have an insurer who has the reinsurance capacity for it or has taken out what we call a treaty, but we are 
all feeding into the Lloyd's market through a fronting arrangement. Sunlam is fronting the AIG policy. AIG in the past, when they were still operating here, they had, uh, they had a, a, a policy with a treaty. Now Sunlam is fronting the AIG policy. Jubilee, as well as Britam, they all fit into the Lloyd's uh, market, which has capacity over 400 million. Pricing is on a risk to risk basis. So, and, and insurers use sometimes pre-risk tools, you know, to assess your risk. So every, it's not one dress fits all, every risk is unique. For some who take out large sums insured, yes, there can be also large retentions or what we call deductibles, deductibles, okay? Underwriting submission, again, you'll be asked about uh, your business overview, your operations, your IT, the security of your organization, the vendors that you deal with, if you're operating any point of sale. Basically, they want to know the entire ecosystem of your organization. Uh, and of course, there's always the assessment to find out how much uh, you're likely to lose in terms of valuing uh, your cyber risk. And the business interruption is based on EML maximum probable loss of what you're likely to lose and your loss history, if you have any in that space. So this is the Minite approach, and this is my last slide. Uh, Minite approach, we as your brokers, we work on in, in, in a collaborative uh, approach. It's not that cyber is very specialized. So it's not an off the shelf product that you can pick and sell, like, you know, a motor policy, very, very specialized, regard, requires a lot of engagement. That's why for us, we call it a collaborative approach for Minet, so that they can help you to analyze, to identify, to analyze the exposures, and then explain to you the available uh, alternative solutions that you can take. Sometimes these solutions are actually not insurance solutions, but you can use the services of other providers to help you with what Noah was talking about to achieve cyber security and cyber resilience. We also support you in terms of submission and development. I've said it's a very complicated market. So you need the services of an expert to hold your hand, to help you, to support you through the entire process of, of underwriting and making sure that you submit favorable underwriting information to present to the markets. Then we have market leverage. Of course, through our network of Aeon as a correspondent broker, we have access to some of the best markets in Europe in the Lloyd's market. So we're able to get good policy work guardings for our clients and to negotiate ne favorable terms and aggressive pricing from these insurers. Of course, we are part of the strategic negotiations, again, to make sure that we, we, you get a good deal and we're ultimately able to meet your required goals in terms of risk management. Our claims capabilities, I think, are known. We can always share this information. We work to, with you on post-incident services uh, through a panel of providers but also support you through the claims processing, which is usually driven by those service providers, but we are there all the way and support you through any interactions with the loss adjusters. And lastly is of course, cutting edge solutions. We look at the end to end solutions. I told you earlier is that a collaboration. We can support you in the risk assessment or risk identification process in working around the risk mitigation and then helping you with portions of your risk that you can insure, but also helping you with a post-loss uh, solution in case you suffer any loss. And of course, because the risk keeps evolving, we move with you as the risk evolves and are able to support you all the way. That's why we call it the end-to-end -end value chain uh, risk solution from Minnet. I think that's it from my side, Alan. I hope it was not a, a rush. I was trying to manage time. Uh, yeah, thank you again for this opportunity to present to you. And I look forward to your questions, your comments. Back to you, Alain. All right, thank you very much, uh, Winnie. If we were in an audience, I would say a round of applause, but we are where we are. Winnie, thank you very much. I think after Brian talked about the evolution of uh, cyber security, and then uh, Noah came in and talked about cyber resilience, I think the question that was lingering in our minds was, are there solutions? So Winnie, thank you so much for letting our attendees know that there are solutions, there are insurance solutions that can uh, address the cyber risk that is before us. Uh, please allow me, we will go into a moment of uh, Q&A. Emmanuel Joshua Mugume, I see your hand up. I will give you an opportunity later, but let's just have uh, a round of questions. I'll start with you, Brian, and uh, two questions to you. One is from uh, James Dungu, and he says, what are the signals of a cyber attack? 
you know, apart from the IT personnel, the ordinary, you know, staff, how do they get to suspect that that's a cyber attack and, and, and deal with it? That's number one uh, for you, Brian. And then the second one is for you to give us some examples of uh, cyber attacks in Uganda specifically. I know that that came out in Winnie's presentation, but you could just touch on that. Brian, over to you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, yes, uh, for the first question about um, anyone observing whether they are under attack uh, in terms of cybersecurity, um, normally like what our, our slogan is normally to keep it simple. And uh, if, if you do realize most companies are insisting on having uh, cybersecurity lessons every every year there is normally the uh, cybersecurity day in um, cybersecurity month in october and even though you're not it savvy you can always learn the basics and uh, following these principles actually goes a very long way in keeping your applications your systems secure so you don't really have to be it savvy but just knowing the basics to, to protect your systems um, goes a long way. So um, like I mentioned, it's, it's best to always keep it simple, learn the basics, and always have that security awareness every year. So that at least you keep on refreshing and you keep on learning um, maybe the new trends the attackers are using in every year. So that keeps you on your toes, it keeps you on your feet. And uh, yeah, so you don't really have to be IT, um, IT savvy in order to, to know that you're being breached or, or you're being attacked. Um, the second question, if you could kindly repeat it, I did quite get that one. Alan? Sorry, Brian, the second question is, uh, give us examples of cyber attacks or cyber incidences that have happened here in Uganda. Uh, when you could put back that slide uh, briefly, um, but but Brian, over to you. Cyber incidences. You could just talk through some of the incidents mm. that have happened specifically in Uganda. Um, I um, <laughs> that's a very touchy one now. Um, um, I I think if we all recall, there was a time when um, MTN and Airtel had to shut down their services. Uh, because of a breach that happened, I think with a very famous bank. And um, it was one way that um, the attackers actually used, and it was a very simple technique of what they did. And by having those platforms integrated, um, there was a way somehow that the, the systems were attacked and uh, data was uh, exfiltrated. And um, People actually, I think there were some people who lost money. I didn't rather follow that story up, but it does happen with uh, with financial institutions, telecoms. Um, though most of the time it doesn't really come to the media, uh, but from what I can tell, is uh, just because of publicity and reputation, it does happen. It could happen, but it's just not published in the media. So. Um, I can only mention just a few with those companies that that actually are revenue, they, they, their revenues are quite high. And that is where the, where the money is, that is where the attackers go. So yeah, that, that, that was one that was in the papers, I'm sure about that. So then uh, the third question was... Um... No, Brian, it was just those two uh, for that yeah, Just those two. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Brian, for those elaborate responses. Elder Noah, uh, some questions here for you. Judith Namugenyi is asking, could you comment about cyber resilience and cyber security in the work from home environment? This links in well with Eric Chironde's question. Uh, in this age where people are working from home, other than using paid and secure VPNs, what else can IT teams do to protect organizations their users. So Elder Noah, I'll take that as one question uh, because it talks about protection, you know, organizations, the steps that organizations should take to protect themselves with the work from home uh, environment. The second one is from Cyrus Turinawe. 
He says, are there any available cybersecurity online courses that can be undertaken, especially this, during this lockdown? Uh, Elder Noah, over to you. Okay, I'll uh, start with that, the last question because it's the easiest one. Um, there, there are many, there are very many uh, online. If you just Google free online cybersecurity courses, there, there are hundreds and thousands of them. Uh, the platforms I would recommend are things like EDX or Coursera. Those ones usually have either very cheap, very low cost courses or, very, or free courses. Uh, there's even SANS, S-A-N-S, uh, S-A-N-S dot O-R-G. Uh, also has uh, free cybersecurity courses, so you can just go there and and uh, and, and get them. On the work from home uh, dynamic that is now prevalent, one of the one of the key things to understand, uh, both as stakeholders or as business operators, is that um, the, the the threat landscape has widened, uh, and this is particularly for the techno for the for the technical people. Because the threat landscape has widened, whereas you'd only need to protect your corporate information within the confines of your office. Uh, I know many organizations that you, you only have access to the corporate office when you're physically in the office. Now, many organizations have to extend that corporate office to the last mile, where now people have access to that at home. And so the first thing that was mentioned in that question also was the use of VPNs. And don't use free VPNs for crying out loud. Free VPNs, you're always paying for it one way or another either through lack of security or through the, your personal data. And so I always an, an advocate, if you're an organization, there are, there are VPNs at different price points, but make sure you're paying for the VPN. Then secondly, many of these um, tools and operating systems that we use are now being upgraded to facilitate for work from home. I can speak for, uh, you know, confidently for, uh, you know, platforms like Microsoft, of which many organizations use, uh, I, I can, you know, many of your computers that run Windows, and your IT and, uh, and your IT managers uh, do. You use group policies. Uh, you know, this is these are policies that are that are that are deployed at a corporate level so that you can control how people access information within an organization. Many of these have been upgraded to facilitate from work for work from home, and so just upgrading that or just finding out more information about that can go a long way in helping secure. But then I'll always fall back to my number one weapon against cyber threats. My number one weapon is knowledge. And Brian has emphasized this quite a bit. Get information. Cyber hygiene is now like, you know, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. In this day and age, what COVID has done is that it has accelerated digitization. But with the acceleration of digitization comes with the acceleration of cyber risk. Because many organizations to keep their doors open to continue operating, they had to quickly digitize. And they, this speed was so high that they did not consider uh, security. So the security design for work from home is completely different from the traditional work that we know. And so your first layer of security is, is, is knowledge. Get information about uh, cyber hygiene. Um, I know Minet, you, the, you can access uh, resources through Minet. I, I also wrote a book on cyber hygiene. You can access through the Minet system. And so just get your people knowledge about uh, cyber hygiene. That will go a long way in protecting your staff. Other than that, the rest are now technical implementations that the IT team can do uh, you know, to, to better protect uh, uh, people who are working remotely. Uh, thank you, Elder Noah. I think he has emphasized the knowledge, the need for knowledge very well. So uh, panelist Winnie, the next set of questions goes to you. Um, kindly clarify what ransomware is and how it happens. That will be your first question, uh, panelist Winnie. And then the next one is from your experience uh, dealing with cyber insurance, what's the uptake uh, in the Ugandan market? Panelist Winnie, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ale. I'll start with the last question. And I request that the first question, I send it to the experts, eh? because I believe explaining ransomware requires, you know, the expert uh, <laughs> detail. <laughs> I'm in insurance, but I understand the risk. I understand how it works. I think I'll request either Brian or Noah to support me on that. But I'll just quickly talk about the last question, uh, really about the experience, uh, my experience on uh, cyber insurance in Uganda. I'll tell you uh, uh, very openly, the uptake is still very low. And I'll tell you why. 
One, it is the awareness. I mean, it took, it's taken a while for people to understand and comprehend that they're sitting with this risk right in their offices. You know, initially, if you talk, if you, if you remember what Brian was discussing and how it has evolved over time, at some point people are thinking, ah, this is, this, 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 this is a problem of the US. It's a problem of these, you know, Europeans, wherever they are sitting. They're so wired, they're doing everything. And, you know, it's, it's, it's their problem until it's the incidents actually started happening here. They, they, there is also that stigma around it and thinking that, look, it's only, it's only large organizations that should go for this, you know, cyber insurance. But I'll tell you that cyber insurance is needed for every single size of organization from small to medium to large to, you know, multinational, it is needed. So it's, it's always that thought and somebody thinking, ah, no, they can't insure cyber insurance for a small organization like, you know, an SME. But there are solutions out there, even for the SME sector. So I think we need to create a lot of awareness. And it's the reason why we're doing these webinars because the, the, the whole goal and idea is to create that awareness so that then people can know exactly how to deal with the risk that's right there in their midst and it's evolving. I mean, this lockdown opened again a lot of eyes for people to see the vulnerabilities they are facing as they work remotely and things that they were taking for granted. Even a simple Zoom, if you go for the free one, you remember what happened with some of our, 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 our colleagues uh, where the, the, the meetings were hacked and they were displaying very unpleasant uh, you know, information. So that awareness is extremely important. So it's, it's, it's the role of organizations to build that awareness. I think it's the role even of our governments, you know, to build uh, that, that awareness. The experts out there, you know, people like Brian and Noah, they're here to support the whole process so that then we get to understand what we ought to be doing in terms of our cyber security, cyber resilience, but most important, understanding that it's a risk that we're living with. Uh, all of us and we need to do something about it in terms of risk management. Thank you, Ali. Hope that helps and answers the question. It does. Yes, it does. From my end, thank you very much, uh, Winnie. Uh, Brian, this will be your last set of questions. I, we are stretching it a bit, but we are about to close. So the panelists will just do one round of questions and then we'll have the parting shots. Uh, Brian, to you, for somebody who is aspiring to acquire cyber sex skills, what is the market like for such talent in Uganda? And then number two, how does an IT guy get the board to realize that cyber security is an important discussion at board level? Brian, those two are yours. Okay, um, in terms of uh, cyber security skills, um, it's, it's not only locally, but it's a global trending knowledge area. Um, I mean, we have been hearing reports about how globally there are about 400, um, nine, 9 million, there are 9 million uh, free jobs uh, globally. Um, people are trying to protect their systems and they definitely need the skills to do that. Um, there are various ways that there are various skill sets you can learn from cybersecurity. Um, in Uganda, the demand is high, especially like I mentioned with the financial institutions, with telecom industries. Um, the market is out there, and that is is is, is a fact. That is that is how it is. Um, and it's a global. It's not only local, but it's a global requirement that you have to have a cyber security or information security personnel within your, um, within your enterprise or your company. I think uh, Bank of Uganda is making it a recommendation that every financial institution needs to have someone on board, skilled, qualified to actually protect the systems because they know the vulnerabilities they, that banks face and uh, the need to have those skills on board is definitely high, as in it's, it's a must. That's, that's how Bank of Uganda now sees it. I don't know about insurance companies. Uh, personally, for myself who works in a financial institution, the risks are very, very high. Then uh, question number two was um, about... Um, sorry, question number, kind of, hmm. for somebody who wants to acquire skills in cybersecurity, what's the market like? Would you recommend somebody goes ahead 
is the job market ready? Are Ugandans appreciating cybersecurity experts? Uh, to answer your question, yes. Cybersecurity, cybersecurity personnel are required in every kind of company or enterprise, um, like I've previously said. So the skill sets, you can start at a very basic level. I believe uh, Noah also shared uh, some links. I shared a link of where you can start. Um, there, there are very many applications that are out there that basically need to be protected. You've got Microsoft applications. Everyone is now trying to move to the cloud. Cloud skills are needed very, <laughs> right now, there are so many companies that need people with cloud security skills, cloud administration. And that's the way we are going because technology evolves. And the more technology evolves, the skills you, you need to have, the, you need to acquire those skills to actually protect your systems. So yeah, um, my answer to that is yes, we do need the skills in Uganda. And it's you can start at a basic level. Um, uh, we have shared the links in the chat. And uh, if you have the passion, if you have the zeal, uh, you, can, you can take it to another level. And yeah, that's the best I can say. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Elder Noah, your next set of questions. Uh, one is with the COVID challenge uh, in the country. What, how has it affected uh, uh, the increase in cyber crime? How has the COVID challenge or the, the outbreak of the pandemic affected the, uh, uh, the cyber crime? That's from uh, Maurice Samogola. Uh, the next one is from James Dungu. James is really pleading with you, Elder Noah, to have the government come up with a policy that can ensure that all companies operating in Uganda have uh, in place cyber insurance to cover them as a must. Elder Noah, over to you. Okay. Um, of course, like I mentioned earlier, uh, because the, the pandemic uh, and the subsequent lockdowns, the pandemic didn't cause the increase in cybersecurity. It's the, it's, the, it's, a, it's the subsequent lockdowns. Now, before, because people are locked down in their homes, uh, the, the internet usage increased and there was increasing pressure for businesses and organizations to avail work resources or work tools or work facilitation for people to be able to work at home. Now, mainly this was fulfilled through digital tools. And so because we are working, there, is, there was an increase in digitization. Uh, the, 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 the classic example I usually give, which might sound like a joke, but it paints the picture. Uh, Uganda had desired to use a video conferencing for meetings uh, as a country, at least as government back in 2007. I remember the time in 2007 they were launching, no, actually 2006 when they were launching the, the National Fiber Backbone. And one of the features that it was supposed to facilitate was for uh, MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies to be able to communicate using video conferencing so that we don't have to come into meetings. That was their desire back in 2006. Now, you know, almost 20, you know, 20 something years, you know, many years later, that was never reality. But in the first three weeks of the lockdown last year, the entire government was working on Zoom. It took three weeks because of COVID, it took three weeks, something that Uganda had taken 15 years and failed to implement. So what does that, what does that tell you? The COVID pandemic and the lockdowns are increased digitization, but because of the accelerated way in which the digitization happened, not many organizations had time to go back and think about the security practices and regimes that need to be in place to make that uh, you know, secure. And so what we also see is that with the same increase in digitization, there was an increase in vulnerabilities and the cyber attacks also increased. This whole ransomware wave we are seeing now, it's not new. We have had ransomware for very many years. Uh, I remember you know, going and trying to help organizations in Uganda almost 10 years ago, just dealing with ransomware. The reason ransomware has hit the organization is, is, is becoming hot cake now is because every system is remote. There's a lot of vulnerability and not the sufficient protection of these systems. So of course, when there is no, when there's an increase in digitization and lower security, all these risks are going to come out. So it's not a new wave. It has always been there, it's just that more and more people are falling victim to it. And so that, that's, that's how the pandemic has affected. And like I mentioned earlier, the remedy is number one. And, and, and we have been singing this song let's always make sure we are aware. Awareness is number one. Cyber hygiene is our first layer of defense. 
Secondly, uh, like I mentioned, make sure you run, don't run pirated software. If you're using any pirated software, just know you're already vulnerable. If not, you've already been hacked. Number two, make sure your, your organization, I've worked, uh, I've seen organizations, uh, which is really sad, very well to do organizations. And then when someone up, you know, switches on his computer, you see Windows needs to be activating. You know, on the corner there, you are running an unactivated version of Windows. When you see that, just know you're already vulnerable. If not, you're already hacked. You've been hacked. Run genuine software, make sure it is updated. Those are the basics, the real basics. The more complex things like IT systems and what can always be done, because these IT people also are savvy. They're not, they're, they're not sitting doing that. Sometimes it's the problem is, which someone asks, it's the board, the manager, they don't understand. When an IT person says, buy this software, he says, are, are your IT bills up to high? Explaining in simple terms, simple English, to boards, that's what I've discovered is the magical is the magical silver bullet to get cybersecurity adopted and at board level, simple English, because boards are out there to make sure the organization is business is profitable. If they see that a cyber risk can cause losses in the organization, believe me, they will give you all the budget you want. Just speak in plain English. Don't go there with IP, VPN, CG, what all those complex things just make people shut off. Simple English where they understand the risk and impact to business is what makes you win with boards. Thank you, Elder Noah. Simple English, simple English, simple English. Uh, panelist Winnie, your last set of questions too. One is how can somebody access um, cyber insurance? And then number two, is it affordable? Uh, uh, thank you, Alan, and thanks for those uh, two questions. Uh, one is how one can access cyber insurance. You can access cyber insurance through uh, a broker uh, risk, who is your risk advisor, like Minet. So if you want to, how to navigate and understand how cyber insurance works, you can come to us. We'll be able to support you and, uh, and, and walk you through what the whole insurance entails. We can also do sensitization in case you need even a wider group of people that needs to have the buy-in. We can always come in and help you to, to, to work around that so that it makes the whole buying process much easier. So please, yes, you can access a cyber insurance uh, through Minet because we're able to link you to the various underwriters and be able to benchmark and compare solutions that are being offered by the different markets. Okay, the second question, uh, Alan, sorry, just quickly remind me. Uh, the second question is, is cyber insurance affordable? Oh, <laughs> very uh, dicey, very tricky uh, question. Uh, I'll just, I think I shared with you about the markets. Uh, currently, we are relying a lot on to the Lloyd's market yeah, in, in London. So what happens is that once uh, international markets are affected by big losses, that imp impacts the entire you know, insurance globally. So what has happened this year between 2019, 2020, because of the big losses that have occurred, this has impacted the cyber insurance and reinsurance market. So yes, there's been a slight increase in the premiums, I think of up to about 30%. We've seen also a, uh, some increase on the deductibles. So yes, we're seeing a shift. We call it a hardening market. Yes, it is a hardening market. But what I mentioned earlier is that each risk is looked at, at, its, at it for its own merits. So it's not one dress fits all that will all be assessed in the same manner, but uh, they'll look at you and what you have inter internally in terms of your cyber security and your cyber resilience and any other risk management measures that you have in place. That perhaps can get you a good deal within the insurance market. But I believe that yes, organizations can be able to afford the premium depending on the level of limits that you have secured. Thank you, Panelist. There was an unanswered question on ransomware. Someone wanted yes. the detail. I think he was supposed to either send it to Brian or, or Noah to support. Yes, him. yes, yes, that's right. Thank you for the reminder, uh, Panelist Winnie. So we have a poll uh, that's coming up. Our panelists are going to give us uh, their parting shots. And uh, Elder Noah, I'm going to ask you to touch on ransomware even as you give your uh, parting shots. Brian will receive some parting shots from you and from Winnie as well. But right now we are putting up a, a, a poll. Uh, 
simple questions, just uh, yes and no answers. Uh, please participate, participate. We want to make these webinars as informative, as relevant to you as, uh, as possible. So the team, the technical team is putting up the, uh, the poll. Uh, but as we do that, I'll ask uh, Elder Noah to uh, answer the question on ransomware and also give us his parting shots. And then we'll come to Brian and then close off with him. Um, thank you very much. Um, my, uh, okay, ransomware, how? Well, ransomware is, um, you see, maybe just to highlight uh, something very quickly. Uh, the way our cyber attacks happen is that you are either duped or someone gains unlawful access to your systems or you're duped to give access to that, uh, to, 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 to uh, a hacker or someone. The methods in which the hackers use changes. It can happen through phishing. It can happen through all sorts of ways. And so once the hacker has access to your computer, they can do two things. They can either, they, they can do a number of things. They can steal your information. They can put uh, malicious software on your computer or they can encrypt your entire computer and make you pay for it. Ransomware is the easiest way for them to get money rather than steal it from you because you don't keep money on your computer. You might keep access to your money or, you know, on your computer, but it's not where the money is. So the path to financial gain for the attacker is much longer. If I have to hack your computer, then I have to hack your bank. That, that, that's a very long process. The easiest way is to lock you out of your computer and then make you pay a ransom for it. That's, what, that's how ransomware works. How the malware gets to your computer is through the traditional ways that we have talked about and Brian talked about them. But it's when the attacker has access to your computer, what they do after that, that changes these dynamics. And like I said earlier, ransomware has been there for very many years. The attackers have been doing it, but it, has, it was always, you know, the, you'll attack someone, uh, you come to for Noah's laptop and there is nothing, you, you, you threaten him and say, yeah, I'll, 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 you know, all your information is encrypted, what? Uh, but then Noah doesn't pay. So the attacker will move on to the next person. But then now that many people at home and critical information is on their laptops, it is now, the laptops are now more valuable. All their work is on their laptops because it's not on some server at office because now everyone has been given remote access. That's why I'm saying that COVID-19 has not, has just amplified what was already there. Many people have now have a lot of value on their mobile devices, on their remote devices. That's why ransomware is becoming a nuisance. So now when you have corporate information and just been locked out, then that's where you, 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 you're duped to, to paying for that ransom so that you have access to your information again. And the best way to protect it, it's very hard to decrypt that one. And there is no guarantee that when you pay the ransom, uh, you know, you, you will get your information back. Usually, it, it's, these are criminals. <laughs> you are trusting their word, yet they have hacked into your system. So it's, the, paying a ransom is, is, is not or is not advised, and no one will advise you. That's why you find countries like the US are trying to ban that. So what, what the best protection for you is to backup. Always make sure you're in a backup. You, 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 you run backups. You know, modern operating systems like the latest Windows, the latest Google, the latest Apple devices always have these synchronizing backups where you can back it in the cloud. And these organizations have invested significantly in, in security. So your information is secure in the clouds. Whether you trust them or not is a different conversation. But believe me, Google spends more on security than you. Microsoft spends more on security than you. So you'd rather trust them and their security expense and expertise than yours. And so that's the, the, the only way to, to have a peaceful mind that you're, you're, you're shielded from, from, from ransomware. Not to, it, will, it will come. That is a guarantee it will come. But your best defense is to know that even if your information is encrypted on the device, somewhere in the cloud, somewhere you can have a recent backup you can fall back to. And so my parting shots is just the information that you can get. So just, the, just knowing that there are these options, gaining information, polishing up on, on, on simple things. Again, I'll, I'll keep mentioning this word, cyber hygiene. Cyber hygiene is the first line of defense for anyone. The same way traditional hygiene keeps communicable diseases away. You know, we were taught these things in primary school or in nursery school, wash your hands, do what this, the same practices we did to keep communicable diseases away. These are the same practices we need to enter into to keep these internet diseases away. Simple hygiene things and communicated in simple language. That's why I, I even labored to write a whole book on cyber hygiene. Why? Because cybersecurity practices were hidden 
in complex language and IT, and IT speak, breaking it down into English where you understand simple English. I, I can even give a very easy example. I had a conversation with my daughter yesterday about cybersecurity and I used the, an analogy of just using tap water. You know, you can't drink tap water. So you can't just, you know, <clears throat> allow internet to enter into your, your, your laptop like tap water. It has to be boiled so that you can, and or filtered so that you can drink it safely. Same thing, don't just put anything, don't just put raw internet into your laptop and then start doing the things you have a, an antivirus, have security protection to clean that internet, to make it consumable by people young. So if you put it in simple English like that, even a 10 year old can understand. And so awareness, awareness is my, is my parting shot. Thank you, Elder Noah. Cyber hygiene, cyber hygiene. Elder Noah mentioned that he has a book on cyber hygiene. Please reach out to me if you need a copy of that, self-appointed marketer. Uh, Brian, your parting shots. Thank you, Alan. Um, I think my, my parting shots, um, Noah just took the words out of my mouth. So <laughs> I can't say it any, any much better, but um, there is normally a saying that it's not how, but when you will be attacked. So you you can't you you need to. We need to always be on our toes. We need to be aware. We need to be alert. Um, if you don't have to be an IT techie to to actually protect your systems, but it's necessary that everyone in the company in your enterprise is is uh, security aware knows the basics just like um just like noah said keep it simple um a lot of we have always had this this phrase that has been going around digital transformation we are using computers more and more to make our lives easier but the more we use them the more vulnerable we are so and the more the more the more the, the, the attackers are even becoming cleverer at it at, as in penetrating the system. So it's always to go, it's always good to be on your toes, know what to do right, keep it simple, just follow the security awareness knowledge sessions and you'll be fine. Um, that's, that's, that's my parting shot, just keep it simple as well. Thank you, panelists. Brian, keep it simple, keep it simple, don't complicate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists, Brian. Uh, panelists, Winnie, your parting shots. Okay, uh, thank you. I think it's well said by Brian and, uh, and, and, and Noah. That simplicity, I think it's very important. Uh, I think uh, we've all heard what has been said. I think very, very deep insights from our, my co-panelists. Uh, cyber is real, that threat is real, it is evolving, it is still, tomorrow. I mean, we will be talking about even future, we're going to start anticipating the risks, yeah, because of what we're seeing right now, and with all the technology uh, development, we're going to start anticipating the future risks, or these future cyber risks. So what uh, Noah mentioned earlier, and said that cyber security is not a tool, you know, is not a one-off, it is a culture. I think for me, that is very powerful. It is a culture. And I think we should all, you know, plug that somewhere in top where we can be able to see it within our offices uh, and at home somewhere to say, look, cybersecurity is a culture. It's a culture at home. It's a culture in the office, or, you know, at your personal level and at organization level. So, and, and, and that's why I think talking about cybersecurity and the buy-in from top, there has to be a tone at the top, we talked about boards being involved, senior management being involved, down to the very you know, front officers within the organization. It has to run through if it's the real culture, the way it is, it's the way of doing things. So I'd like to urge uh, all, all officers, board members, anyone in senior leadership, in middle management, please let's all embrace this risk and make a cybersecurity a culture within our organization. Uh, cyber resilience, also the, the same thing, you know, that we need to do. Let's be prepared at all times. For us as Minet, we're here to help you in managing risk. Please feel free to reach out to us anytime to give you any form of advice, to link you to the experts out there. We already have two of them here today with us. 
please come and talk to us so that we can be able to support you through this uh, risk management journey and have the interventions like insurance, among others that have already been shared uh, this afternoon. I'd like to say a big thank you to Brian and Noah for this very insightful conversation. I think all the issues and um, points you raised were very, very pertinent, very valuable information. So we really, really appreciate that you are part of this uh, webinar this afternoon. And of course, I would like to thank our participants, over 100 participants that made it here today. We appreciate your time. We appreciate, we're very excited that you actually made it amid this, all these challenging times. Uh, there was something positive in the new vision today. I think talking about the numbers, the, the numbers seem to be going down you know, based on, uh, on, on the lockdown. So let's hope for more positive results and more uh, positives being uh, reported so that at least we can go back to what we're doing and even focus more around uh, growing our organizations. Thank you again, our participants, and thank you to our very good uh, panelists. I mean, uh, moderator, Allen, you've done a fantastic job. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Panelist Winnie. I was about to take it personal. Uh, thank you very much, Panelist Winnie. I cannot overemphasize that cyber security has got to be part of an, an organization's culture. So thank you, uh, Panelist Winnie, for bringing that up. Every organization should have cyber security as part of their culture. Thank you. I think Winnie has put it very well. We had a great panel, very knowledgeable and yet you know, able to bring to us all this knowledge in a simple way. Thank you, panelist Brian. Thank you, panelist Noah. Thank you, panelist uh, Winnie. I know that uh, there were some questions coming in uh, from yes. people who wanted to access the presentations. You shared with us your email addresses. We will be able to share with you the presentations through the emails that you shared with us. Thank you very much. Our hope is that at the end of this webinar, you will know that cyber is evolving you will know how to build a resilient uh, culture towards cyber crime, and that you will know that there are ways of risk management to manage uh, cyber through insurance and all the other solutions that are available. Thank you very much, our attendees. Thank you for sticking with us. I know that we've stretched it a bit, but who wouldn't? This was such, uh, uh, such, uh, such an insightful uh, session. Thank you very much and uh, we'll close it here. Enjoy the rest of the evening.